The brain is fundamentally the root of our experience. Your vision, your hearing, your thoughts, your memories. I mean, we know that the world exists out there, but your experience of that world is created in your brain that is updated by information coming in through your senses. All engineering in some sense is about manipulating reality. We're building things, we're making the world different than it was before, whether this is with controlling electrons and electronics or optics or building cars or planes. This is all about kind of changing the world as it exists out there. But you can imagine inverting this and changing the world as it exists in here. And that is a very different way of thinking about the future. At Science, we think of ourselves as a vertically integrated, full-stack neural engineering company. We build a broad range of technologies for interfacing with and engineering brains, whether this means restoring vision through the optic nerve or potentially better cochlear implants down the road. Brain-computer interface has become a, a hot topic over the last five or so years. In any neural interface system, there are really three components. There's the probe, which is the part that actually contacts the brain tissue one way or another. There's a, an electronic device called a head stage, which connects the probe to the network. And then there's software that sits in the network and talks to the head stage for some purpose. The research goes back quite far. So there was academic groups all the way back to the 70s and 80s that were recording single unit neural activity in the brains of monkeys and using this to control simple computer setups. And then in the early 2000s, there was a company called Cyberkinetics that used a technology called the Utah Ray, which was developed at the University of Utah in the mid-90s, to be kind of a very early version of these companies. So we've been reading collectively motor activity out of the brains of paralyzed patients for almost 30 years now. The thing that really held this up uh, for clinical translation was twofold. One, we wanted better probes. And the second is the electronics needed to be miniaturized and made low power enough that you could completely close the skin over the implant and wirelessly communicate through the scalp. And that wasn't really possible until the last seven or eight years. And since then, there's been a big acceleration in the field. We want to build tools and devices that empower individuals to have agency over their life. If you've lost your sight, you lose a lot of freedom. If you've lost the ability to speak, this is incredibly isolating. So the, the first thing that we're bringing to market that's by far the furthest along is our visual prosthesis work, primarily in the retina. Our clinical trial was designed to restore vision to patients that lost it in adulthood, and it was the first time ever in the history of the world that blind patients have been able to read again. This field today is very early. There are relatively basic questions that we don't have good answers to today. Things like, what is the overall architecture of the brain? What are the different parts? How do they fit together? How are they wired up? And this is partly why we make some of the tech that we've developed available to others, because using these to answer these fundamental questions about what is the brain, how does it work, how are these things wired together, when the brain receives information, how does it know what to do with it, how does it know that some information it receives should be seen and some should be heard, and how does it use this to connect to adaptive behavior? These are huge questions that we are going to be a very small part of answering. It is very serious to be talking about implanting a patient. You have to prove that your device is safe and effective. And safe is not negotiable. I mean, I can tell you it's very stressful from the perspective of running the company. You sit there and wait and you hope that everything goes well. And of course it always has, but that is not a joke. What we've seen is that empirically the studies have been very, very safe. This research that us and others are doing is in constant dialogue with society about what are the right risk thresholds. And I'm not aware of any really serious adverse events happening with, with patients that have received these types of neural interfaces so far. Not just us, but all of the other companies operating now and back to cyberkinetics. All of those patients received the implants, used them for a while and recovered. And so I think there's always this tension between our perception of the risk versus the reality. This idea, alter the brain, alter reality, this is, I think, such a transcendent goal that when you come to believe that these things actually are possible, that these technologies are getting to a point where this work is feasible and can succeed, I think it's really exciting. And I, I hope that people will see that technology is not something to be afraid of. This technology is essential to improved quality of life, improved accessibility, 
Technology is, a, is an equalizer in, in ways that almost no other forces in civilization are. It matters how we choose to use it, but the technology itself contains within it the seeds of prosperity for everybody.